everyone, Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We are in the Thanksgiving season, which is so much fun. It's the beginning of the Christmas season. And the one thing I can say about America, as many problems as we have, and there are a lot of problems going on right now in our country, but we are a country where people will drop everything and travel long distances to be with family, to have a meal, to sit down together and have the turkey dinner with all the different fixings and pies and all that and be together and just thank God for family because God is the author of, of families. He is the heavenly father and he sent his son and those of us who are born again are his children. He loves family, uh, large families and extended families. And so what a wonderful thing that our country regardless of our religious beliefs and political beliefs, we can all stop and be thankful to God for all the wonderful blessings he's given us, the small things, the big things, just to have family, to have friends who love us and want to be with us and we can um, have relationship with. It's a wonderful thing that Europe does not do. I lived in Europe for five years and they do not have this day where everyone stops and thanks God for his many blessings. It's, a, it's something unique to the United States. And as a kid, I actually didn't really like Thanksgiving that much because there were no presents involved and it was just food. But as I got older, I really loved Thanksgiving because it was such a great time of family. And of course, Christmas is too, but Christmas is very hectic. But um, so it's a wonderful time for all of us to, to be very thankful and to pray and take the authority that God gave us when we were born again in Christ Jesus and he made us part of the body of Christ. We now are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. All the wonderful blessings that Jesus has, and he has everything, are ours as well. And so we have the power and the authority to pray in the name of Jesus and to expect for things to improve in our world, for wicked leaders to be exposed for the charlatans that they are and to step down and for godly, maybe not even Christian, but godly men and women, preferably Christian, take those positions and advance the kingdom God has always used believers and non-believers to advance his purposes. And you can see that uh, throughout the Old Covenant. King ne Nebuchadnezzar is a classic example. He was God's servant. He did the will of God, even though he was a wicked man. And before he died, God humbled him. And you can go read about that in the Old Covenant but God humbled King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and turned him into a wild beast, basically. And, and he lost his mind, and he, they set him out to pasture, and kind of a, a, a little bit of a fairy tale type story, even though it is authentic and it is true. But God humbled him to the lowest place until he confessed that God was the God of the Most High. And God has a way of doing that. He has a way of using people who aren't believers, but using them for his purposes, and then eventually getting them to come around and acknowledge God. So um, we have the power and the authority to pray that he put godly men and women in places and positions of authority to make the right decisions, to make the decisions that God wants made, and that we be protected supernaturally from all kinds of terrorist attacks. There were rumors that there was going to be a terrorist attack in Atlanta, which is my uh, hometown. Uh, not my hometown, but it's where I live. And I saw that, and I just prayed, and I said, no, in the name of Jesus, there will be no terrorist attack in this city. In the name of Jesus, all plans be thwarted, fall to the ground, come to naught. And so let's keep praying as we thank God during this Thanksgiving season for all he's done for us, all the wonderful many blessings. We thank him for the power and the authority to play, pray in Jesus' name that we be protected in every way possible. We're in Matthew 
And we're looking again at chapter 22. We still haven't finished chapter 22, Jesus confronting the Pharisees. Before Judgment Day comes, there's a lot of opportunity for Jesus to confront them and um, try to convince them to believe. Because they should have believed, but they did not. So we saw that the Sadducees came and they tried to trip him up in his speech. And they gave him the whole hypothetical about the woman who had married seven different brothers. Uh, they'd all died and, and she had no children. And in the resurrection, whose uh, wife would she be? And Jesus explained that this was going to be a spiritual kingdom. He didn't come out and say it that way. But he said that God is the God of the living. God is not the God of the dead. And in this new kingdom... People will not be given in marriage the way they are in the old covenant system where a woman was given to a man and she was practically owned by the man and she didn't have a lot of rights and power and authority. She was subject to her husband. Um, but in this new kingdom, there was not going to be that kind of hierarchy amongst men. When you came into this new kingdom, you became a child of God, and you were not acknowledged as either male, female, Jew, or Greek, slave, nor free. You were the new man in Christ Jesus. That's how God sees his children. Now, yes, I'm a woman. My husband is a man. We're married, and we are one, un one married unit. He is the head of the household because he is the man, but yet I am not under him. As an individual, I am not his property. I have rights and privileges, just as he has rights and privileges. And we work together as a unit, as a partnership, which is God's intention. And in the spiritual realm, I am God's child every bit as much as my husband is God's child. And God does not see him more favorably than he sees me. We're in Christ Jesus. And because we're in Christ Jesus, he loves us. And he blesses us. And we have all the rights and privileges that Jesus has because we're in Jesus. So it's a spiritual kingdom. It was never meant to be an earthly kingdom. And I, I've been doing some studies on the whole end times uh, dispensational belief. And, and I've told you all that in my research over two years, I found that none of that is supported in the Bible, and that whole dispensational belief is that God wants a physical kingdom on the planet run by Israel. That uh, Israel is really his um, spokesperson on the planet, and that he's waiting for the right time for uh, Israel to come and believe and accept Messiah, and... Um, and then he will rule and reign from Jerusalem in a temple that's rebuilt. And they will be his representatives on the earth. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no scripture to support that. It's a spiritual kingdom that was offered. A spiritual kingdom was what Jesus was describing in all these parables. A spiritual king with spiritual children who believe, and as they believe and they walk out this faith, physical manifestation will come, glory, favor, blessing, wonderful uh, kingdom advancements would occur, and every nation would be blessed. Every nation would be uh, walking in the glory of God, and the representatives of God on the planet would be the church. Not the Catholic Church, not the Pope. The church, the believing children of God, are God's representatives on the planet. This creates a lot of confusion because in the denominational churches and the Catholic Church, um, there are people sitting in the pews who are not born again. They are not children of God. They can come in and they can sit and they can do all the different things. Uh, they can pray, they can sing hymns, and they can be deacons and uh, elders and all that kind of thing. But if they don't really believe, if they haven't been born again, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And a wolf in a sheep's clothing does not make him a sheep. He's still a wolf. And this creates a lot of confusion in the world because they see 
people in the churches who don't manifest God's glory. And so they're smart enough to know it's a fraud. These people are frauds. And so it's incumbent upon those of us who truly believe um, to get out of false teaching and to manifest the glory of God and preach the truth and show God's love and mercy and reveal God to a lost and dying world um, and to not compromise the truth, to not buy into this whole philosophy and theology that Israel is God's favorite, that they are the apple of his eye, that they are the ones that he truly desires to be his representative on the planet. And, and that the natural branches, um, when I say the natural branches, I mean the lineal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ones who he truly wants to bless. And that the church is an afterthought. The church is just destined for weakness and will one day be raptured out of here and snatched out. You will not find any proof of that in the Bible. None at all. Um, there are no scriptures to support it. And it wasn't even popular until this view was not even popular to the mid-1800s. So we see here in Matthew, spiritual kingdom is being described. We saw with the, the coin that had Caesar's face and superscription. And God, uh, Jesus said, render the, the things that belong to Caesar to Caesar and things that uh, belong to God to God. This is a spiritual kingdom that was going to coexist with earthly kingdoms. But as it grew and developed, it would touch those earthly kingdoms. And those earthly kingdoms would be affected and would be changed. And they would embrace the kingdom principles. And they would then manifest glory. And they would manifest favor. And they would manifest abundance and blessing and all of that. So that's what the kingdom is. This is what was being offered. And because the leaders were so entrenched in their flesh and so entrenched with rule, um, ab abiding by the rules and doing works, they could not see what they were meant to see. They could not see that there's, a, there's something beyond the veil. There's an existence that's beyond what I can see and feel and touch, and smell. It's, it's, it's of God. God it, it's something that is in the spirit realm. It can't be seen. And science has shown that there are lots of things we can't see, but they're there. We can't see the smallest atom with our naked eye. We can't see certain types of light with our naked eye, but it's there. It's, it's there, and it's doing what it's uh, program to do. And so Jesus continues to explain this, and he explains this again. We're going to see this right here um, where the Pharisees, oh, they come back. The Pharisees aren't giving up. They're going to try to trap him again. Verse 34. So when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. So they're, they're not giving up. They're going to prove this Jesus as the heretic they believe he is, the blasphemer. Um, and then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, now these questions are not questions that they are truly desiring an answer to. I believe these are questions they're getting together. These are smart, learned men. And they're getting together and they're coming up with questions that they know either A, there's no answer to this question, or B, if you try to answer the question, you are going to be incriminating yourself as a blasphemer, heretic, as someone who doesn't truly understand the law, and it would out you as a fraud. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to come up with questions that will out Jesus as the fraud they believe he is. So here they go. They say, Master, uh, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And we know there's 10 commandments. So they're probably taking bets as, as to which one uh, he would say is the most important of the 10. And then they're going to be ready with their rebuttal and their arguments to prove that he's wrong. And one of the 10 commandments that today is an issue amongst many people, I even have family members who 
who believe this is uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. There are people today who claim to be born-again Christians. They believe if you do not keep the Sabbath the way the Jews did in the Old Covenant, then that you uh, basically lie vertical on your sofa all day long without lifting a finger, you're going to hell. They believe that. And what they fail to realize is that old covenant law to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy was a picture pointing to God's Sabbath. What was God's Sabbath? His day of rest. Go look at the book of Hebrews. Enter into the place of rest. And what is that? Being born again. Becoming part of God's family. Being part of the body of Christ. You cease from your laboring under the law when you become part of the body of Christ. You cease from your labors. You enter into his rest. And those with spiritual eyes to see will see this. Go read the book of Hebrews. I believe the writer is the Apostle Paul. He explains it beautifully. Um, But people who are still trapped in old covenant mindsets, they still believe. If you even get behind the wheel of a car and drive somewhere, I mean, God forbid, if a family member becomes ill and has to go to the hospital. You know, Jesus even said, hypocrite, who of you would not rescue your donkey that's fallen into a well on the Sabbath? I mean, if you let the donkey there all day, the donkey would be dead uh, uh, come um, come uh, Sunday morning, which was when the Sabbath, well, actually it would be 6 p.m., uh, you'd have to wait till 6 p.m., which was when the new day began in the Jewish calendar. Um, you'd have to wait till 6 p.m. Uh, to get the donkey out. And, um, and and so that makes no sense. And we know that uh, Jesus healed on the Sabbath, and he um, did all sorts of quote-unquote work on the Sabbath because he knew what the Sabbath really meant. Um, it was entering into God's place of rest, which was being offered to Israel. Come and enter into the place of rest. Okay, so that's one that even today people argue about. I've had people hand me books on uh, on you need to be um, uh, honoring God's Sabbath on Saturday. If you honor his Sabbath on Sunday, you're going to hell. I mean, come on. No. Where is that in Scripture? that the new covenant born again child of God is going to hell because they celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday. Okay, so here we go. Here's the question. What is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answers, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's the Jewish Shema, which you will find in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord thy God, hero Israel. Um, the Lord is one. He is one God. We are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said the second one uh, is like unto it, is similar. To, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So on those two wonderful commandments, love, based on love, love God, love your neighbor, All the other commandments will fall in line. Now, that fits beautifully with this idea of being born again. When you become born again, God writes his laws on your heart. In the Old Covenant, you had to go to the law and you had to see what you weren't supposed to do. And and you looked and you memorized and you studied what you weren't supposed to do that would show you what you were supposed to do. But in the new covenant, you get born again. He writes his laws on, the, on, on our heart, and we automatically know what to do. We don't have to go read a list of what we don't have to do to know what to do. We just know what to do because we're new creations. We do that which we have been created to do. We are created in Jesus's likeness. We become like Jesus. We have his spirit. We are part of his body. And, um, and we have the mind of Christ. And so we have the power and the authority to turn away from sin. He, ha- he turned away from sin. He was tempted in all respects, but he didn't sin. 
We likewise have the power. Do you know that you have the power? You may not have been told that. You've probably been told, as I've been told, that you're just a sinner and you're going to sin and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, that's not the truth. The truth is you will be tempted to sin, but you have the power and the authority to turn away from sin just as Jesus did. And one of the ways we do that is by quoting a scripture, which he did, and turning to the Lord, asking him for strength and help. If we find that our flesh is weak, we can go to the Lord and we say, Lord, help us. Give me the strength to turn away from this thing, which I know you don't want me doing, um, that I don't even want to do. And, um, and so we have the power and the authority to do things that we couldn't do before. That's the difference. And so here... We see, love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love thy neighbor as, as thyself. On those two things, everything else is going to fall into place. Same is true when you get born again. You get the Spirit of God, Spirit of Jesus. You become part of his body. Lots of things fall into place. Lots of things become easy. Lots of things you just know, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. And that is the wonderful thing about being born again. Now, the irony of him telling them this is how can anyone who is under the law, who hasn't been born again, ever love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength? I mean, you would have to be Jesus before you could ever love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, there are people today who believe that they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they believe that they are loving Him by doing good works. They don't realize the only way they can really love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength is they have to be born again. They have to become a new creation. It's impossible to love people in that way without becoming a new creation. You have to have the love of God inside of you. None of us can love God and love people the way he does unless he puts that love in us. And the only way he puts that love in us is we have to be born again. And so this answer silenced them uh, because I'm sure they were not prepared for this response. So they go away and, and Jesus... Um, He's not done with them. He has something else he wants to discuss with them. Uh, and he questions them about David's son, who is the Messiah. Now, we know from 2 Samuel 7 that God promised David a son who uh, would have a kingdom forever. Let's go look at this. 2 Samuel 7. Um I'm going to read this because this is important. It came to pass when the king, this is King David, sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass at night, that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? In other words, had God ever asked Israel, Why haven't you built me a house of cedar? He never did ask them that. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own. 
and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Now here's the Messianic covenant right here. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Right there is the prophecy of the chastening and the scourging of the Lord Jesus Christ for iniquity. Not his iniquity, but for the iniquity of Israel and for all mankind. Um, he would be whipped and bear the stripes of, uh, of that iniquity. But God says further, he says, But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all this vision. So did Nathan speak unto David. And David was so excited. He go further and... Um, he is so excited that God has done this, that God has promised this. Um, and he goes on to say, he acknowledges that, uh, that this was going to be a, a kingdom that would happen sometime in the distant future. It was destined to happen in the distant future. And you can go and you can read David's prayer from, from verse 18 down to verse 29. Um, and so David knew that the prophet was promising David that from his seed, from his natural seed, would come one who God would establish a kingdom that would be forever. It would last forever. And he knew it was for a distant generation, some distance in the gener a distant generation. And of course, uh, at the time that Jesus is sharing this information with the Pharisees, many years had passed, you know, thousand plus years had passed since the time that the prophet gave that prophecy to David. And the Messiah had not yet come to their knowledge. They supposedly were waiting for him to come. And they were expecting someone like David and like Solomon who would come in as an earthly king and would put down the Roman Empire and establish the kingdom the way Solomon had established it. And this was their, their understanding. And Jesus is telling them, no, it's a different type of kingdom. So in the Messianic Covenant, there's a, Mas a Messiah, an anointed one, who is the seed of David. So Jesus says, when he goes to question them, he says, uh, so the Pharisees had gathered together around Jesus. This is verse 41. We're back in Matthew 22. And Jesus says, What think ye of the Christ, the anointed one? Whose son is he? Well, they all easily would say, Well, David's son, because we just read in 2 Samuel 7, he was going to be from the seed of David. Everybody knew that. And he said unto them, How then does David... In the spirit, call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? Now let's see, Jesus is quoting Psalms 110. So let's go look at that real quick. We're going to look at Psalms 110 and see uh, what he's quoting. Okay. So this is the words of David speaking in the Spirit. 
And, and this is uh, Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, the Lord God says to my Lord, the Messiah. That's what the Amplified says. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. All right, so Jesus is saying, how is it if the Messiah is the offspring of David, the seed of David, his natural son from his own bowels, how is it that in the spirit he calls his son Lord? In order for his son to be his Lord, um, he would have to have existed before David ever existed. Think about it this way. Would the Queen of England ever call Prince William Lord? Well, no. Prince William will never be Lord until she and Prince Charles are long dead. They will have to die before he ever becomes Lord King. But by then, she and Charles are gone, so how could she ever call William Lord? The same is true with David. David would have to be long gone before the Messiah was anointed king and was Lord, unless he existed before David. He would have had to have existed before David, before David could call him Lord in the Spirit. Now, that takes spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear. It's almost a puzzle, isn't it? you got to stop and think about it. Well, the Pharisees were dumbfounded because uh, maybe they had wondered uh, why David would call the Messiah his Lord. Why would he do that in that Psalms? Um, and it says that no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. After that, they were done with their questions because, see, he had crossed over into a spiritual realm Jesus had. They knew the only way David could call the Messiah Lord is David would have had to have seen him and known him before his death. He was a Messiah who was a God-man who existed before. That was too much for them to accept, too much for them to discuss, too much for them to even contemplate. And so from then on, no more questions. And so, um, you know, these, these answers are wonderful. If you're born again, these answers are wonderful. And, you know, we need to arm ourselves with this information so that when we do get in those discussions with non-believers who don't want to believe in Jesus, um, and maybe they do quiz you with questions about the law, you can bring these things up and you can do it in love. And you can do it with gentleness and just get people to think about it. Get people to think about it. Maybe they go away and they ponder and they think and they pray and, and they go to their pastor or they go to their rabbi and they ask these questions. And I've done that with my Jewish friends. I've asked them, why does the word say this? Why does the Torah say this? Um, okay, have you asked uh, your rabbi? Um, well, I'll ask and I'll find out why it says that. And all it does is it gets them to think. So we're going to stop here. The next chapter's pretty depressing. It's the woes of the Pharisees, which I don't like, but it's in the Word and we need to study it. I pray everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Enjoy your time with your family. Continue to pray. Be blessed. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a blessed day.